Yeshua is all throughout the Devar, all the word. Yeshua will give you his life and his energy from his Devar. I will exalt you, my God, the King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is Adonai and greatly to be praised. That his greatness is unsearchable. One generation will praise your words to another and declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and your wonders. Adonai upholds all who fall and raises up all who bow down. The eyes of all who look to you, and you give them food on time. You open your hand and satisfy every living thing with favour. Adonai is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. Adonai is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He will fulfil the desire of those who fear him. He will hear their cry and save them. Adonai watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth declares the praise of Adonai. Let's praise him. My mouth declares the praise of Adonai. Hallelujah. Let's rise together. Shema Israel. all your goodness.
Answered and said, We have sinned against Adonai. We will go up and fight just as Adonai our God commanded us. So each of you strapped on his weapons of war, figuring it was easy to go up the hill up to the hill country. But Adonai said to me, Tell them, do not go up and fight, for I am not with you, and you will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you. But you would not listen. You rebelled against the command of Adonai and presumptuously went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and they chased you as bees do and scattered you from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before Adonai. But Adonai did not listen to your voice or pay attention to you. Seven, Shabbat Shalom. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness by the way to the Sea of Reeds, just as Adonai told me. We went around the hill country of Seir for many days. Adonai spoke to me, saying, You have gone around this hill country long enough. Turn to the north. Command the people, saying, You are about to cross into the territory of your relatives, the sons of Esau. Who dwell in Seir. They will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, not even a footprint, because I have given the hill country of Seir to Esau as a possession. You are to buy food from them for money so that you may eat, and you are also to buy water from them for money so that you may drink. For Adonai, your God, has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These 40 years, Adonai, your God, has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on past our relatives, the sons of Esau, who dwell in Seir, away from the way of the Arabah, from Elah and Ezion Geber. We turned and passed by the way of the wilderness to Moab. Adonai said to me, do not harass Moab or engage them in battle. 
for I will not give you any of his land for a possession, because I have given it to Ar, to the children of Lot for a possession. The Emim used to live there, a great and numerous people, as tall as the Anakim. These people also are considered Rephaim, like the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Emim. Now the Horites used to live in Seir, but the sons of Esau drove them out and destroyed them from before themselves and settled in their place. Just as Israel did to the land of its possession that Adonai gave to them. Now rise up and cross over the Wadi Zered. So we went up over the Wadi Zered, the time that we traveled from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the Wadi Zered was 38 years, until all the generation of the men of war from within the camp came to an end, as Adonai had sworn to them. Indeed, the hand of Adonai was against them to destroy them from within the camp until they came to their end. Now, when all the men of war had finished dying from among the people, Adonai spoke to me, saying, Today, you are about to cross the border of Moab to Ar, or at Ar. When you come opposite the sons of Ammon, do not harass or provoke them, for I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon for a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. That also is considered a land of Rephaim. Rephaim used to live there, but the Ammonites call them <coughs> Zamzumim, a great and numerous people, as tall as the Anakim, but Adonai destroyed them from before them, and the Ammonites dispossessed them and settled in their place. It was just as Adonai did for the sons of Esau who dwell in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them. They drove them out and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kafturim, who came from Crete, destroyed them and settled in their place. Rise up, journey on, and cross over the Wadi Anon. See, I have handed over Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it. Engage him in battle. This very day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under heaven. When they hear the report about you, they will tremble and twist in angu anguish because of you. So I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of Shalom, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will go only by the way of the road. I will not turn to the right or to the left.
percent of our loss to get rid of to this thing. Once you make fuel, like that, it's still on. And so the river mouse in the dead end, like that, it's gone to the ledge as far as the wadi and more. In the middle of the wadi, there's border as far as the wadi yabot, the border of the children of Yom Amon. And in the river from the Biyarbon, there's the border. From Kinnereth, as far as the Sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, the low slopes of Pisgah on the east. And I commanded you at that time, saying, Yahweh your Elohim has given you this land to possess. All you sons of might, pass over arms before your brothers, the children of Israel. But let your wives and your little ones and your livestock, and I know that you have much livestock, stay in your cities which I have given you, until Yahweh has given rest to your brothers as to you. And they also possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim has given them beyond the Yarden. Then you shall return, each man to his possession which I have given you. And I commanded Yehoshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your Elohim has done to these two sovereigns. Yahweh does the same to all the lands which are, you are passing over. Do not fear them, for Yahweh your Elohim himself fights for you. Good morning to the following. Good morning. We'll be reading from Yeshiyahu, Isaiah. This is the vision of Yeshiyahu, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim during the days of Yeziahu, Yotam, Akaf, and Yeshiyahu, kings of Yehuda. Hear heaven, listen earth, for Adonai is speaking. I raised and brought up children, but they rebelled against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's stall, but Israel does not know. O oh, sinful nation, a people weighed down by inequity, descendants of evildoers, immoral children, they have abandoned Adonai, turned against their back. The whole head is sick, the whole heart is diseased. From the sole of the foot to the head, there's nothing healthy, only wounds. Swords haven't been dressed or bandits are bent with lance, for in is the valley your land and your presence. It's as desolate as if overwhelmed by a flood. The daughter of Zion is left like a shack in a vineyard, like a shed in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. If Adonai Tavaot had not left us a tiny, tiny remnant, we would have become like Edom, we would have resembled Amora. Hear what Adonai says, you rulers of Edom. Listen to Korah, you people of Amora. Why are all those sacrifices offered to me, asks Adonai. I've fed up with burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. Yes, you come to appear in my presence, but who asked you to do this to trample through my courtyard? Stop bringing worthless grain offerings. They are like disgusting incense to me. Rosh Hodesh, Shabbat, calling congr convocation. I can't stand evil together with your assemblies. Everything in me hates your Rosh Hodesh and your festivals. I'm tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. No matter how much you pray, I won't be listening. Because your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Get your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Defend orphans. Plead for the widow. Come now, says Adonai. Let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of Adonai has spoken. How faithful city has become a war. Once she was filled with justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderous. Your silver is no longer pure. Your wine is watered down. Your leaders are rebels, friends of thieves. They all love bribes and run after gifts. 
they give no justice to orphans, the widow's complaint doesn't catch their attention. Uh -huh. Therefore, says the Lord, Adonai Tzavot, the mighty one of Israel, I will free myself of my adversaries, I will take vengeance on my enemies, but I will also turn my hands against you. I will cleanse your impurities as with lie and remove all your alloyed base metal. I will restore your judges as at first and your adversaries, sorry, and your advisors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, faithful city. Zion will be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. Shalom. Let us read the words of Yeshua, who said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he trims so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. The branch cannot itself produce fruit unless it abides on the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and is dried up. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done to you, for you. In this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as my Father has loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I am no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends, because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I selected you so that you would go and produce fruit, and your fruit would remain. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I command you, so that you may love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world, since I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But these things they will do to you 
for the sake of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. Just as the Ruach of HaKadosh says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers put me to the test, though they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked by this generation, and I said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways as I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you as an evil heart of unbelief that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day by day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For you have become partners of Messiah, if we hold our original conviction firm until the end. As it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now which ones heard and rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt with Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Was it not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter in because lack of trust. Let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open, some of you would seem to have fallen short. For we also have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the word they heard did not help them, because they were not unified with those who listened in faith. Just as God has said, so in my wrath I swore they shall never enter my rest, even though his works were finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall never enter my rest. So then it remains for some to enter into it, Yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. Again, God appoints a certain day, today, saying through David after so long a time, just as, just as it has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. Thank God, and we're on, on here, are we? All good? Well, I just want to say firstly, it's great to see you all here today. Look, it's a lot better than looking at a uh, laptop screen. But it's worth it. We've got people from, we've got Christine from Germany, possibly. I don't know. I didn't even look at the participants this morning. We were having computers crashing up and down and everything like that. It's, but it's worth it. We've got people from um, New Zealand to be on, and we're just so glad to have you with us. It's just such a joy to be fellowshipping together with people here and people here on the seats here and on the laptops. To me, the, I was reading a scripture, and uh, Yeshua uh, opened the scroll, and then he found, he found the place. He found it, and he read it, and then he, un he rolled the scroll back up. I don't see anyone who's got their scrolls here. No scrolls here. We've got, we've got 
paperbacks. Some people have got phones. Some people have other things. And um, that's what we do. We open the laptop, we find where the thing is, and then we go to it and we make it possible. And it's just so awesome just to fellowship. I want to thank everyone who helps put the seats out. Otherwise, we'd be sitting on the floor, which is okay. And running all the cables and making it all possible. But let's make a start. I just want to turn around. It's heard this morning. <laughs> the word Deuteronomy, which is in some of our Bibles, is it's not actually in the Bible. It's a Greek word meaning repetition of the Torah. Moshe is retelling and explaining the Torah in his own words to prepare the Israelites to go into the promised land. Do you have those um, words there? You can bring them up. So that's uh, Devarim. This is the uh, Hebrew word which we use. So whenever we say Devarim, we're saying the word words. The first words of the book of Devarim are Elah. Ha Devarim, meaning these are the words. So we call this book Devarim, which means words. Now, Devarim has more of a meaning than just words. It also means a speech, a matter, an account of something that happened. The singular of Devarim is Devar, the word below there. In Hebraic, devar and devarim often have the same meaning. We see this in Devarim chapter 1, verse 1. And these are the devarim words. This devar word of Moshe. And last week's parasha concluded the Torah portion in the book of, I can, I'm not good on Hebrew, Bimibba, is that how you say it? Sorry? Bimibah, numbers, with Israel standing on the banks of Jordan, ready to cross into the promised land. Before we can enter into the promises of Adonai, we have to first enter into his devar, enter into his word. John chapter 1, verse 1. We all know the scripture. In the beginning was the word. And when I was at Bible college in 1991, that's not that long ago, was it? And I, I wasn't three years old. <laughs> it wasn't my parents. I myself was at Bible college. <laughs> we were taught this. In the beginning was the logos. Because in those days, they said Yeshua and his Apostles and his disciples, they all spoke Greek. That's what they taught us back then. And Logos is different to Devarim. It's a Greek word. Logos is the Greek word. It means, the Logos means having a thought. Reasoning out that thought. Oops, sorry. Reasoning out that thought. And then presenting the conclusion of those thoughts. Logos thinks like this. God had to reassess this situation. Those, those Israelites, they failed him. So God then had to think up a, another thing, and that's when he gave his son. Devar, on the other hand, is this. Elohim's intention was to always give his son for his chosen people. That was always the matter. That was always the devar at hand. And this matter, this devar, has never changed. So in Matthew to Revelation, is the word, which we have in our Bibles, does it, is it coming from the Greek logos, or is it coming from the Hebrew devar? <laughs> Seven and a half years ago, the Prime Minister of Israel at the time, Netanyahu, told Pope Francis this, Jesus was here. In Israel, and he, he spoke, and in, in this land, he said, and he spoke Hebrew. Aramaic, the Pope interjected. Interesting, change of Greek to Aramaic. And this got me thinking. 
Who is correct here? Is it Prime Minister Netanyahu with the Hebrew? Or the Pope with Aramaic? So I was like, okay, I'm going to go and have a look at the oldest Catholic documents, which some are some of the oldest Christian documents in the world. I found this one of the early Catholic fathers, Bishop Papias of Heropolis, wrote in about 135 AD, Matthew collected the sayings of Jesus in the Hebrew language, and each one translated them as best he could. Why did Matthew write in Hebrew? Because that was his language, and it was the language of the Jewish people he lived with. It's not just ends here. I found I kept on finding more. We're not going to go into them, but another one. Moving on to 210 AD, a bit later, the Catholic father Origen says Matthew was published in Hebrew for Jewish believers. Why did he give it the Jewish people of the time in Hebrew if they didn't speak Hebrew, if they spoke Aramaic? And then... I was wondering, well, maybe just Matthew. Maybe that's the only book which was written in Hebrew. All the others are written in Greek, aren't they? The Catholic father Clement of Alexandria wrote before 215 AD, the epistle to the Hebrews is the work of Paul, and that it was written to the Hebrews in the Hebrew language, but that Luke translated it carefully and published it for the Greeks. Well, what about archaeology? You know, what have they dug up? What have they found? What is the physical evidence found? Well, they've dug up and they've found almost 1,000 original texts in the land of Israel, dating to the times, or thereabout of the times, of Yeshua and the 12 apostles, which more than 85% is written in Hebrew. You can see the chart up there. That's a big part of the pie, isn't it? 13% is written in Hebrew. And just two little percent is written in Greek. <laughs> Looks pretty Hebrew to me. I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu might have been on the right track, maybe. But we can't really prove it. Anyone been around there in the time? Anyone old enough? Opa, you're getting to be a grand age. We're going to have a wonderful birthday party with you. Were you around in the time of Yeshua? Now we have to go about... 20 times your age, don't we? Yes, yes. From 500 to 1500 AD, the Catholic Church tried to force Jews to become Catholics. And during this time, many Jewish documents were confiscated. The ones in Greek and Latin were burnt. But the ones in the other languages, they did not burn them. Burn them. They couldn't read them, and they didn't know their language. And they were fearful that some of them could be the Holy Bible. So they stockpiled them, just put them away. Over the last 20 years, the Catholic Vatican have been going through their archives and taking photos and putting them on the internet. Here's something that I found in the Catholic Vatican. It's published about five years ago, and it's on their website. All Hebrew to me, isn't it? Or probably Hebrew to most of us. Some people might be able to read that. The whole document they have given us, this document they've given us, it's just the first page. And the interesting thing about it, it's amongst just other random Hebrew documents, which have got nothing to do with the Bible. Let's zoom in into the first sentence. There's two words there circled. Do you know what those, we've had them up before, what are those words? The one in the circle. That's the devar there twice. The first word up there, which we're missing just the first part of it, is Breshet. Where's Breshet found? Genesis chapter 1, Breshet. What does Breshet mean? In the beginning. Hmm. What does this read? Breshet, in the beginning, was the... What's up here? What's in the circle? Was the Devar, the word. And the Devar was with, in the last word down here, if you can read Hebrew, 
is, says the Elohim, because ha is, is the, the Elohim. It's actually the first uh, page of um, John. Um, pity I haven't been able to find any scholars who have been looking into that one. But it's interesting. They've got a lot of stuff there. <laughs> and also, they've also found a lot of documents and they're coming about from all around the world. Over in Russia, they've been able to go into the museums and find stuff. But it's just interesting. But interesting thing about this text, it agrees with Psalms chapter 33, verse 6. By the devour of Yahweh, the heavens were made. Might just have a little drink. Need a drink after getting all my wonderful friends and people on Zoom on this morning. John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. And Yeshua says, For if you were believing Moshe, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But since you do not believe my believe his writings, how will you believe my devarim, my words? If we do not know the devar of Moshe, how can we understand the devar of Yeshua? This is why we have it every week. For the whole year, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sorry, I'm saying them in the English. I should say Devarim, but in the, the first one's Breshet. But in all those first five books, they are the ones of Moses, Moshe, and they all speak of Yeshua right through it. Might look a bit hidden at times. If you knew the Hebrew, you'll see it. It's all throughout there. Yeshua is all throughout the Devar, all the word. The Devar, the word, reveals Yeshua. Whenever you read Genesis to Malachi, always look out for Yeshua because he's there all the way through it. You can't see Yeshua at this time. He's not to be found in pictures and paintings, but we see Yeshua in the Devar, in the word, and we learn of Yeshua in the Devar, in the word. If you want to know Yeshua more, Spend more and more time in the Devar, in the Word, and you will know Him more and more in your life. Feeling lonely? Open the Devarim, open the Bible. It will reveal Yeshua and His love for you. Feeling really worn out? Absolutely exhausted. Finding it hard to go on? Like your, your life's been drained from you? Go to the Devar. Yeshua will give you his life and his energy from his Devar. Yeshua says, the, the, the Devarim, words that I speak to you, are spirit and are life and truth and so much more. It's interesting. I found this in Jacob and James. We find that salvation comes from two things, both from Yeshua, and also from the Va. Receive with meekness the implanted Deva, which is able to save your life. But James goes on and says, Yeshua is able to save. These two things save us, Deva and Yeshua. James chapter 1 verse 21 and James chapter 4 verse 12. Also, Yeshua and the Devar, they are both light. Like all this bright light shining on me, way brighter. Brightest lights. When you looked at the lighting now, I can't see this. <laughs> Your Devar is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Yeshua was life, and the life was the light of men. Psalms chapter 119, verse 105, and John chapter 1, verse 4. Did anyone have breakfast this morning? Does, did anyone eat, does anyone eat each day? How, many, how often do you eat? You might eat, is it twice a day? Three times? Maybe ten times a day. 
How often do we partake of the devour, the Bible? Do you read the Bible as often as you eat? In Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, we find that for 40 days, Moshe only partook of the devour, the word. And he did not eat bread or drink water. He wrote on the tablets the devare of the covenant. The ten, the ten what? Words. The ten, devar, the ten devarim. The ten matters because words in this context means like matters. What's the matter at hand here? This is the one. This matter, this matter, this matter, this matter. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Yeshua said, It has been written in Devarim chapter 8, verse 3, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every devour, every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. What happens when your body is starved of food? You feeling good? Feeling great? Feeling really energetic? If you haven't eaten for a few days? You might, some of us it might just miss a meal. It's like, oh, I need to, if you've got a big job on that morning, you've got to put another wheat bix into the plate. You've got to have a bit more food if you know you're going to do more. Let's not starve our spirits and be weak. Let, like we eat food, we need to partake of the devour, the word. The world around us contaminates us with filth and desires. Galatians chapter 5 verse 26 tells us, that, tells us that Yeshua cleanses us through the washing of the devar, the word. If we have no devar, then Yeshua, he's got nothing to cleanse us with. It's kind of like trying to wash your car with the hose. The tap's been turned off. How much devour word do you have you taken in? And do you take in daily to give Yeshua to wash yourself with? Reading just a little devour each week is, is like someone washing the car with just a little trickle coming out of the hose. You're going over the car and it'll be just a trickle. How are you going to wash your car? Some people here are into the devour and the word so much, it's like having Yeshua. Yeshua's got a water cannon. He's just found a blast and wash us whiter than snow. Let's always give Yeshua more and more devour to thoroughly wash ourselves with. If you're too tired to read the Bible, tune in to Bethel TV. It's on YouTube. Sometimes I'm a bit, I get, I get, uh, I, I get worn out. I have a problem with the inflammation, tiredness. It's just wonderful to put it on. And there you go. You've got all these wonderful people smiling back to you and sharing with us the diva. It's wonderful. It's a real blessing to me. Devarium chapter 1, verse 22. Then all the people came near to Moshe. Hey, let's send men ahead of us to explore the land for us. And bring us back to Var about the way we should go up and the cities we will enter. The Israelites had already heard Adonai's Diva, Adonai's way, but they wanted their very own Diva. That they wanted their own way. Let us read the Diva of Adonai to find his way. To go in his way, not our way. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we had this reading. Thank you. I just love the readers. Normally, I love the readers. Uh, this time, I'm going to go back and I'm going to re-listen on the, on the TV. <laughs> Stop bringing fertile offerings. Yeah, and since it's an abomination to me, new moons, Shabbats, the cooling of gatherings, I am unable to bear unrighteousness and assembling. My being hates your new moons and your appointed times. 
They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. This is a famous scripture many Christians quote. It is quote it to prove that all the Shabbats have been done away with, that they are not to that people are not to meet together on the Shabbat. But the scripture does not say that at all. It's not. It's, it says this, not to have unrighteousness when we gather together on the Shabbats. I really like this. Kevin keeps saying it to us as, and saying it to me. And it, it just keeps it echoing in my, in my brain. What is it, Kevin? Con, context. 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 Okay, so let's see how Isaiah chapter 1 begins in verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, these four kings of Judah. The context is not fa actually found here in Isaiah. Instead, it's found in two kings and two chronicles, because you've got to find the detailed accounts of the four kings, which the people at the time when they heard Isaiah, they knew this. They probably knew it off by heart. King Uzziah dishonored Elohim by burning incense to Adonai in the temple of Adonai. Only the Kohanim, the priests, were allowed to burn Adonai's incense. We find this in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16 and 18. Second king, King Jotham, he added a gate to the house of Adonai. There's nowhere showing that he had the approval of Adonai to do this. Imagine you come home one day and your lawn's been beautifully mowed and then you find there's an extra door being put in your house. It's being put in by the lawnmower man. <laughs> the gain access to your house. <laughs> Would you be happy about that? No, he should have asked you first, shouldn't he? What Would you have said no? <laughs> no, it's my house, not your house. Third king, King Ahaz, he plundered the house of Adonai. And he did many other abominations. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1, 4, 21, 25. This is the context which Isaiah has spoken in. Fourth king, King Hezekiah, he stripped off the gold from the doors and the doorposts of the temple of Adonai and gave them to the king, a foreign Gentile king of Assyria. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 16, and 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 35. These four kings desecrated Adonai's holy temple and did their very own Shabbats and not Adonai's Shabbats. When we alter or add to Adonai's Shabbats in any way, shape, or form, they are no longer Adonai's Shabbats but our own abominable Shabbats. And moving the seventh day Shabbat to one of the six works days is just one example of this amongst many. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 23, Moshe said to them, this is what Yahweh has said, tomorrow is a rest. A Shabbat set apart and holy unto Yahweh. Shabbat is to be unto Yahweh. Not unto ourselves. Not to do our own thing. But his thing. Adonai says, my being hates your new moons and your appointed times. And even though Adonai has given us his Shabbats, they are still to be done his way, not our way, because they are his Shabbats. In 1990, it's not that long ago, is it? <laughs> I was a trainee missionary in the Trobian Islands, and I wasn't seven years old. I was a young man. <laughs> I found myself in a primitive culture living just outside a village in a bush material hut, which was still being built. The stars were the roof and a flimsy tarpaulin was the wall. <laughs> Wasn't that comfortable. Now, once a year, each year, just once a year, the villagers harvest large root vegetables called yams. That's a big one. That's probably like the Paramount Chiefs one. 
They put them into a big heap and do a big festival and first carry the yams of the village chief through the village entrance to the chief's yam hut, just through the village gate. And you can see there's another picture. That's them carrying the yams. And that's how it's done. They, they, they get a big piece of wood and two baskets and put them on and they carry them. It's actually pretty heavy. Well, they're making it look simple. They're strong. But uh, they gave me... Um, and after this is done, after they carry the um, chief's yams through the village gate into his hut, in the, into the yam hut, it's a special house made for it. And after this is done, the festival continues and the rest of the villagers can then bring their very own yams into the village. And there was only one Christian family in that village. And they gave me two baskets on a branch to carry on my shoulder. And it was too heavy, so they cut it down and they gave me two tiny, tiny baskets. They're so tiny. And even then, I was walking with them and I was struggling. I know you guys are way stronger than me and you'd do it easy, but it was hot. It was really hot. The sweat was dripping off me. I had to walk 20 minutes because the gardens are far away from the village. Man, it was tough. And I was sweating. I was tired. And they all left me. They just, they just kept on walking. I couldn't keep up. I'm supposed to keep up. No, I couldn't keep up. I was struggling. And I was carrying this. And my shoulder was so sore. I put a shoulder. Oh, man. Both shoulders were so hot. I just wanted to get them off me. I just wanted to get to the village. I was just like, this. Finally, I saw the village entrance and I went through. And when the villagers saw me, they looked shocked. And they ran into their houses. And the Christian family's hut was on the other side of the village. So I was carrying the yams straight through the middle of what was now an empty village. Everyone had vacated. I could see the top of people's heads as they secretly stared at me. As I approached the hut, the Christian family were going like this. Well, don't you want the yams? <laughs> My shoulders are so sore, you know. As soon as they got to the hut, they said, what have you done? Like, Can't you see I got the yams to you? <laughs> they were scared for my life, and they quickly whisked me through the bush to a hut outside the village. Thinking, mm, I might have somehow broken one of their customs, maybe. <laughs> They tell me that customs, you got to be really careful. You know, you don't want to upset their customs. And then they inform me that only the chief's yams are to be carried through the cake. No one else's yams. They've got to be taken through the outside. No yams, not even the chief's yams are to be, to be carried through the village. Anyone doing these things will be put to death. That's how serious they Take it. I had gone into their place, and instead of doing it their cultural way, I had done it my way, done it my own way. I had gone against them. In the same way, Adonai's kingdom has a culture. It has its ways of doing things. We are not to do the kingdom of God way, our way. It's got to be done Elohim's way. The Devar, the word, shows us the way of the kingdom culture, which leads to life and not to death. Now, during my time there, I hadn't seen the people who had been killed because they had already been buried for some reason. But I had seen the bad injuries, really. I'd seen one guy paralyzed, some real serious injuries, some people missing limbs because they'd had they'd been having wars up to that time. Another village gets upset with another village, they go to fight, and it's bad. The sun was setting, so they put me in the center of the hut. And then, why choose a hut? It's got no walls or no roof. <laughs> and um, they had me lie down, and I was surrounded by men for my protection. And in the night, they came. It was scary. The, I could, the people around me, they were, they were kind of shouting. Some of them were running into the bush. They had bush all of them had bush knives. I mean, not this little knife. They're nice. Their knives are like this. They all had bush knives. Some had spears. They were ready to fight for me. But they didn't come to kill me. Right through the night, right through the night, 
till the morning, till the sun broke, they came. They came in secret. They came through and they were asking these three questions. What, what is the meaning of these three signs? And they're like, what? Haven't you come to kill the white man? No, no, no. We've, we've seen three signs. We need to know the answer to these three signs. Number one, we have never seen a white man carry yams. Number two, we have never seen any non-chief's yams carried through the village gates. Only the chief's yams carried through the gate. And number three, we have never seen anyone carry yams through the village square, not even the chief's yams. What do these three signs mean? And in just brief words, they told them that I was there because of the love of Jesus. And that night, many villagers made decisions for the Messiah right through the night. One of the Papua New Guinean missionaries, he's from another place in Papua New Guinea, then asked, what is the purpose of the laws around the land? Yams, why have them? And he got no answer. And he said that this part of these villagers' culture, which is different to anywhere else in Papua New Guinea, has been put in place for this very day. Because without these laws and the breaking of these laws by the white man, many would not have be turned to Messiah this day very day. Adonai's culture is higher. And it's Adonai's culture that takes precedence. But I'm not saying don't just, you've got to do it his way. You've got to be careful. Don't go in and offend people. Really, you have to listen carefully and find his way. So what was the kingdom culture being broken in Isaiah chapter 1? What was the devarum, the matter, really at hand here? It's, it's not about if we should or should not keep the Shabbat. It's not about that at all. So what is, it, what is the devar? What is the matter really here? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21. The faithful city once was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in here, but now murderers. So what was the justice that they were failing to do here? And one of the answers is found in verse 17. They were not relieving the oppressed. They were not defending the orphan. And they were not pleading for the widow. They were not for the, there for them at all. I really enjoy a Rev Shabbat, the Thursdays and Fridays, and buying our favorite food, foods and preparing them, so that I can just have, I can just rest and have. A great meal at home with my wife, the most beautiful woman in the world. It's not me who has to go to Specsavers, it's all of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with my eyes. But it's no good if we're having such a great Shabbat and someone else is missing out. Maybe someone couldn't make it to our Shabbat gathering today. Because they are ill. We can get in touch with them and see how they are, to pray for them, and ask if they can be, ask them if you can be of help for them. Or they might be on the Zoom, because some people at times, people can't come here because they're not well, so they go on the Zoom. Go to the back, chat to them, ask them. I want to say to them, can I please pray for you? Ask them, is there any way, can I help you? If someone is in hospital, who's in hospital at the moment? Tracy? Who? And Bruce, Brucey. Yeah. Go and see them. Put the Bethel TV on your phone and show them the, 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 the meeting. Not this one, this one's. Go on to Joel's one and <laughs> go on to the others. Oh, yeah, if you really want to. Yeah, okay, you can. You can. Anyway, I can't stop. Um, keep your eyes open. For anyone in need. Maybe you get to the supermarket counter during the week and the person in front of you hasn't got enough money to buy the groceries. Oh, come on, I've got to get going, you know. I can't be waiting around here. And you notice after they bust around with the coins and they, they can't get it all, so they leave some behind and say, that's a bit of a nuisance. They weren't going to get it anyway. How about buying the remaining groceries for them? It's no good that 
we ourselves are feasting and having a wonderful time on Shabbat and someone else is missing out. If you haven't done it yet, invite your house for so invite someone to your house for a Rev Shabbat or Shabbat. Or do like what Molly and I like to do, my wife and I like to do. We invite ourselves to someone else's home. <laughs> well that's 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 against custom, isn't it? You know, we, yeah, not if, but not if we bring all the food. <laughs> and we bring our wonderful Shabbat feast and we spend the uh, hours cooking and even preparing beforehand and buying the best food and taking the best and taking all our wonderful Shabbat to their house and feasting with them. That's kingdom culture. We sometimes need to get out of our own culture and go in what culture God, uh, Elohim has for us. And when someone is struggling to carry their baskets of yaps, the yams of hardship, the yams of discouragement and depression and loneliness, loneliness. Because we all go through those times, don't we? Not carrying yams, of course, like I was over there, but these are the things we just want help with. It. It's hard to carry it. Oh, oh, let's be there for them. Bear it with them. Pray with them. Give them a diva, a word of encouragement. Help them. How can I help them? Ask, is there any way I can be of help? Because, you know, I'm feeling I don't do something here. And we're going to finish off Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. I'm going to use the Greek word here. So there remains a sabbatismos for the people of Elohim. Sabbatismos, a Greek word, what does that mean? It means a keeping of the Shabbat, and it only means that. So there remains a Shabbat keeping, and who's it for? For the people, it means a Shabbat keeping for the people of Elohim. The Aramaic Peshitta Bible, it's interesting how it puts it. It says this, it is therefore the duty of the people of Elohim to keep the Shabbat. Shabbat is for all the people of Elohim, all the Jewish people, and all the people who have joined themselves to Adonai, Yeshua, our Messiah. It's for all the people of Elohim. Keeping Adonai Shabbat is just one of the indicators amongst many on who Elohim's people truly are. It was great. It's true, isn't it? When we think of somebody during the week or today, if we, if we got their number, we can text them and say, I've just been thinking about you. I'm just praying for you. And then go a step further. Is there anything else you need? Because what does Yeshua say? If we, someone comes to us with a need and we say, oh, we'll pray for you, and we send them away with no food and no clothes. So we are, we are good to be family. We can be family because he's faithful. Here we go. Your mercies are new every morning. Your grace for me.
secure a sunny day. Help her and guide her. Thank you. You are our rock. You will stand on you. Stand together for the blessing. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was here. Hallelujah. It was very inspiring. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Berak Adonai Berish Merika. Adonai panabalecha v'kunecha Yisha Adonai panabalecha v'yashem lecha v'yashem lecha v'yashem lecha Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh turn his face to you and grant you shalom and grant you shalom. And grant you shalom and bring peace. Go and share his word. Go and share his divine. Go and share his light and his love and his hope and his strength. And be his help and his peace and his, his light to our dying community, a community of, that needs hope, a community that needs lifting up, a community that needs purpose, a community that needs you. Have we just ask blessing on each one. As they go in your strength, they will not be fearful. No one will be concerned or be anxious about the news or anything that's going on around about them because you are in charge. And you're our hope. You're our light. You are our strength and our light. Chazak, chazak, vernet, chazek. Be strength, be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Number one, about your life.